Hi everyone, let's take a look at our solar system. You have probably heard that it's more than 4.5 billion years old. But let's take a look at the evidence, shall we? This presentation has two main parts. The first half is about evidence for a recent creation, and the second part is about evidence for a recent catastrophe. The first part has seven chapters. First, the magnetic field. The first one to ever measure the magnetic field was Carl Friedrich Gauss in 1830. Ever since we measured the magnetic field, it decays with the rate of 5% per century. Another scientist, Barnes, calculated based on this decay value that the Earth's core has an average electrical conductivity of 40,000 Siemens. We know the size of the Earth's core and we know that it's made of iron. So we can compare this with decay that we measure in laboratory experiments. And when we do that, we see that it's perfectly consistent. And based on this knowledge, we can say that the Earth's magnetic field can only decrease. We can also reverse calculate to find out what the Earth's magnetic field should be like in the past. And when we do that, we see that the entire world would have been molten only 30,000 years ago, because the Earth's magnetic field was so powerful back then. So the Earth cannot be millions of years old. Well, now, a lot of people allegedly know that the Earth is old, so they have come up with a theory to explain why the Earth has a magnetic field for billions of years. And that theory is the dynamo theory. So, they say, the Earth works like a dynamo. This theory was invented over a century ago. First, when you look at the dynamo, you can see that it's kinda complex. The Earth's core is just a ball of molten iron. Yes, there are some currents there, but it doesn't look remotely like a dynamo. Nevertheless, we can always try, of course. Maybe the Earth's core could work like a dynamo in a different way. So, for more than a century, scientists have performed dozens of experiments to figure out how it would work. None of them was successful. And here you can read a random example where they say a dynamo was not produced. So the dynamo theory contradicts the evidence. When I tell people this, I often get the objection that some computer simulations do actually match paleomagnetic data. Paleomagnetism is the magnetic field that is recorded in rocks. It seems like the magnetic field has flipped north-south every now and then, and these computer simulations match that perfectly. For the paleomagnetism, that is correct, backed up with evidence for the computer simulation that assumes the dynamo theory works. So this is not evidence for an old magnetic field of the Earth at all. In fact, scientists admit that experiments imply a young Earth. And they add to it, for a few brief weeks, researchers thought the mystery might be solved. In recent months, however, actual experiments using diamonds and lasers to recreate the intense conditions of the planet's core raise doubt that the paradox will be resolved so easily. This is Dr. Russell Humphreys. Humphreys doesn't believe the Earth is old and explains the magnetic field as called by a magnetic flux at creation. If you want to know the details of it, here's a reference to the paper. Anyway, it has something to do with that the magnetic field can be caused by molecules that were all aligned. He also points that the Earth should even be younger than 30,000 years, because during a flip of the magnetic field, a lot of magnetic energy is lost. And just like magnets lose magnetism when you push two magnets with the same pole to each other. Based on his theory, he made predictions of the magnetic field of six other planets before they were measured. Five out of six predictions were a match. And the sixth, which is Pluto, still isn't measured. Scientists were absolutely surprised that Mercury has a magnetic field. It should not have a molten core after billions of years. 
but it has. Dr. Humphreys was the only scientist who made correct predictions about the magnetic fields. All others were magnitudes of. Next, warm moons. Other planets have moons. Here are three of them. Europa, which belongs to Jupiter, and Celadus, which belongs to Saturn, and Ariel, which belongs to Uranus. These three moons contain liquid water. Some of them even have water eruptions, which are gigantic geysers. Scientists were surprised that the moons were still warm enough to contain liquid water. They should not be so warm anymore after billions of years. So they did some calculations on processes that could explain why the moons are still warm. The only mechanisms that could cause some heat are tidal effects because they orbit the planet, radioactive processes and chemicals. However, these three moons constantly face the planet with the same side, just like our moon. So there are no tidal effects. There are also not enough heavy materials on the moon to explain the heat by radioactive processes. And last, there aren't enough realistic chemicals to explain the heat. Even all three combined can explain less than 10% of the heat that is on these moons. Experts therefore call the heat mysterious. But if the moons are young, they just did not have the had the time to cool down yet. Pluto. Pluto does not have a large planet to orbit around. So there are no tidal effects. Not even its tiny moon, Charon, does anything significant. So Pluto was expected to be a cold, dead dwarf planet. It was expected that no geologic activity could be there after billions of years. Last year, in 2015, was the first time we have ever had close-ups of Pluto thanks to the New Horizons satellite. And it brought us a big surprise. Pluto is still geologically active. Even Charon, Pluto's tiny moon, is geologically active. Scientists calculated that the surface of Pluto cannot be older than 100 million years. So the New Horizons satellite added another mystery to the list of the billions of years belief. But when Pluto is young, there is no problem. Comets. Comets are those nice space objects that get a tail when they come close to the sun. Therefore, they are not merely rock, like meteors are, but they also contain a lot of ice. All comets have an interstellar origin. Actually, that just means they have an elliptical orbit. An elliptical orbit means they pass the sun again and again. If they would pass the sun only once, their orbit would be hyperbolic. Every time they pass the sun, they lose some material. Hence the tail. This one on the image is Comet Halley. It passes the sun every 200 years. How much material would it have lost in only a few million years? Let alone billions of years? A lot. So much it cannot be billions of years old. Planet formation. We have never seen a planet forming. It supposedly takes too long, so we couldn't observe it in a lifetime anyway. So all we have to base our ideas on is a theory and simulations. This is an animation of a planet forming. It assumes that planets form from dust clouds after a star has exploded. The path is from dust clouds into grains, grains into rocks, rocks into boulders, boulders into asteroids, asteroids into planetoids, and then planetoids into planets. Supposedly, gravity pulls smaller objects into larger objects. However, simulations show that in the rock and boulder stage, gravity is still quite feeble. The chance for a rock to meet another rock by gravity is a lot smaller than the chance that they accidentally impact each other. When they do, you are again left with a dust cloud. So it appears that planet formation never gets past the boulder stage. 
Thus the only evidence we have for planet formation contradicts the theory. Saturn's rings. They are intriguing. But they are also a problem for the billions of years model. It appears they have more structure than expected. They change fast. And most importantly, they dissipate. Within millions of years, there will be very little left of the rings, so it seems they cannot be very old. Radioactive decay. And let me admit that radioactive dating methods form the strongest evidence for an old solar system. However, there's something wrong. Let's take a look at three examples. Flattened radio halos, helium diffusion, and how good does it match geological dating anyway? Flattened radio halos. A radio halo is a small spherical damage in a rock that is caused by radioactivity. Radioactive material emits energy and that amount of energy is very specific. Thus it penetrates rock to some level and the more energy the larger the sphere. This way scientists can tell what type of radioactive material is inside the rock by looking at the properties of the halo. Within some colified rocks we also find radio halos. However, those halos appear to be flat. This is interesting. Within radioactive dating it is assumed that the decay rate is constant. Thus it is possible to calculate how long the decay has been going on. After a few thousand years you get a faint halo. After a million years you get a darker halo, and the more millions of years, the darker the halo. Halos should be perfectly spherical. These halos in rocks aren't. That means they have been flattened. This is possible if a heavier layer on top puts pressure on it. So we find the radioactive decay that happened before the flattening event in the flattened halo, and we find a new sphere of decay that happened after the flattening event. The layers on top are dated many millions of years old. Thus the flattening event should also have happened millions of years ago. However, the spherical halos show only thousands of years. Thus this causes a contradiction. One way to explain this contradiction is by removing the assumption that the decay rate is constant. If decay has been very fast in the past, then there is no contradiction. Thus, accelerated decay seems to be a valid answer. Another piece of evidence. Zircons. Zircons are small crystals that are present within volcanic material. They contain radioactive material and leftovers of radioactive processes. Uranium-238 decays into lead-206. This takes eight radioactive steps. With each step, the atom releases a helium atom. So one decayed atom released eight helium atoms. The atoms stay inside the zircon at first and then slowly leak out. And the team that did this research is called the RAID team. They measured the amount of helium inside zircons that were found in a drilling project. It appears that the helium leaks out slowly when it's cold and a lot faster when it's hot. Based on that, they made two predictions. Prediction 1. The decay happened millions of years ago, and in that case, measurements of helium leakage out of zircons should follow the red line. Prediction 2. The decay happened thousands of years ago. In that case, it should follow the green line. And then it was measured, and the data matches the green line perfectly. So again, we see evidence for accelerated decay. Now let's take a look at this diagram. This shows published radioactive dating results. The vertical axis is for radioactive dating, the horizontal axis is the geological dating. Now there is a trend, but also a very large deviation from the trend. Also, do realize that before radio dating a rock, scientists usually ask in which layers the rock was found. And then they know what method to apply, which gives answers close to what they expected. 
And also, very often, radio dating is rejected when the result is too far off from what is expected. This means the trend may be very artificial, because of cherry-picking the data. Nonetheless, we can see that billions of years worth of decay has happened in the past. But there is evidence for accelerated decay, but there is no sound explanation for it. So here's the conclusion for the first half of this presentation. There is one piece of evidence that seems to point to an old solar system, and that is radioactive decay. The evidence for a young solar system is warm moons, Pluto, the magnetic fields, planetary rings, comets, the planet formation theory fails, and there is evidence for accelerated decay. Now it appears the solar system also shows evidence for a recent catastrophe. First let's look at impacts on the moon. Here's a video from NASA where they show the sequence of impact on the moon according to what is generally accepted today. This video starts with the moon that has already formed. According to this movie this was 4.5 billion years ago. Then one large impact happened on the South Pole 4.3 billion years ago. This is called the South Pole Aitken Basin. Then there is a heavy bombardment causing basins. This lasted from 4.1 to 3.8 billion years ago. Then the volcanism lasted for 3.8 to 1 billion years ago. And in the same period was cratering from smaller meteorites. And that results in the moon we have today. So, formation, large impact, basin formation, volcanism and small cratering. Now let's take a look at the evidence. This is the moon as we see it from Earth. You can clearly see the dark areas where are Mars and large plates of basalt. That's the same material as what we have on our ocean floor. These are Mare Imbrium and Oceanus Procellarum. This is a height map of the moon. Here you can clearly see the impact basins on the moon. Let's zoom in. What we can see is that two of these basins are connected by a lava flow that happened in the past. We also see that Oceanus Procellarum is a lava flow coming from Mare Imbrium. Also, two other impact basins seem connected with the lava flow. Since these lava flows are connected, it seems they have happened nearly simultaneously. Let's take a closer look on Mare Imbrium. Here we see multiple craters. The large one, which is marked yellow, and smaller ones marked green and purple. What would the sequence of these craters be? The yellow one must have been first, otherwise the other ones would have been wiped out. The green one must be second, because it is filled with basalt, while the purple aren't. So this lava backfilling of the green crater means the green crater must have been within weeks after the yellow one. If you see my presentation about heat and the Genesis Flood, you can see that the lava could not have been liquid for years. Thus the interval of these craters must have been very short. When we exaggerate the crater a bit more, we can see some faint other craters in there. These two craters are connected with a straight line. So which of these came first? Well, if either of these would have been later than the other, the later one would be round. This shape we see here probably means these craters formed exactly simultaneously. So did the yellow one or the red ones happen first? It seems that the yellow one must have been first, otherwise the red ones would have been wiped out. So this is the sequence. And all of this mess must have happened within weeks. Only the small purple ones may have formed later. Those faint red craters are called ghost craters. It is one of the arguments placed on a website containing 101 evidences for a young earth on creation.com. It says ghost craters on the moon's Maria are a problem for the assumed long ages. Enormous impacts evidently caused the large craters and lava flows within those craters and this lava partially buried other smaller impact craters within the large craters, leaving ghosts. But this means that the smaller impacts K 
can have been too long after the huge ones, otherwise the lava would have flowed into the larger craters before the smaller impacts. This suggests a very narrow time frame for all this cratering, and by implication the other cratered bodies of our solar system. They suggest the cratering occurred quite quickly. Obviously, this is so much contradicting the generally accepted model that people have written objections. Let's take a look at that. This one comes from a very anti-creationist site called Rational Wiki. This description of ghost crater formation is a straw man, oversimplified to the point of incorrectness. The Mara forming eruptions are known to have occurred millions of years after the impacts based on radiogenic dating of the volcanic basalts and the pre-Mare ejecta. Chemical differentiations and layering observed in Hadley Rail show that the Maria were formed from episodes of volcanism extending over geologic time, not in a single event. So basically they say the lava flow is unrelated to the impact. Lava flow happened millions of years after the impact and there were multiple lava flows and ghost craters are oversimplified. Actually they don't explain what ghost craters are. It makes me wonder if they have actually taken a look at these. When we look at the evidence this conclusion doesn't make sense. How can a lava flow be not related to the impacts? Impacts, especially this large, generate a lot of heat. How can a lava flow be multiple events? It is one large ocean of basalt that poured out of the crater. In case of multiple eruptions, we would see that clearly on this image. There would be multiple plates of basalt and not reaching far away from the crater. So what is their evidence? Radiometric dating and layering. Okay, now... Why would layers of different material prove multiple events? Why would a volcano decide to erupt material A in the first eruption, then material B in the next eruption, and then material C in the third eruption? If all the materials are now on the surface, then it means all this material had been down inside the moon before that. With one eruption, all materials come out together. So it seems much more likely that the layers are because of sorting mechanisms, such as density differences. And we've actually seen that happening on Earth with recent volcanic eruptions. We find many different layers at the eruption of Mount St. Helens, for example. So the layering argument doesn't make sense. How is it rational? And we have already addressed radio dating before as well. Now let's look at secondary craters. First we have this Aitken Basin. It could indeed be a crater, but I'm not entirely sure. In the NASA video it showed that many of the other craters on the moon would be because of the explosion that happened because of this single impact. It caused rubble to be thrown around elsewhere on the moon, thus causing a lot of smaller secondary craters. When we look at the lava backfilling at Oceanus Procellarum, we see that a lot of small impacts happened before the backfilling. The ones marked red are some examples. Others happened after the backfilling, like the ones marked yellow here. And when we see this, we can actually see that probably most of the small craters happened before the backfilling. Now this is a very clear crater on the west side of the moon. It seems like that this one crater is responsible for a lot of other features on the moon. The pattern on the moon can be interpreted like this. So lines of small craters pointing from the large crater, sometimes toward a medium crater. Some of these lines of craters reach very far. This one, for example, surrounds almost a quarter of the moon. So also in this scenario, we see that many impacts happened within a very short time span. Now I would say the, the movie made by NASA isn't bad. The impact shown on the video did very likely happen. However, there seems to be some errors in the sequence and there are especially errors in the time span. There isn't any evidence that the moon can form the way it is assumed. 
Well, theoretically, this South Pole 8 Kim Basin could be a large crater a long time ago. But these large impacts happened nearly simultaneously, so not over a time span of 300 million years. Also, the Mar volcanism cannot last for more than just a few years, not a time span of 2.8 billion years. The majority of the intermediate craters happened before the lava backfilling, so the sequence is incorrect here. So the time span of the model of NASA does not seem to be based on evidence. Now we'll take a look at Mars. Mars has some interesting features that tell us something about the past. On Earth we have tectonics and shifting continents. But it seems Mars has a tiny bit of this as well. Over here we see a fracture of Mars. It is a crack in the crust. It seems that this crack has a crater in the middle. The interesting thing about this crater is that it seems to be split into two parts, and that one part has shifted 150 kilometers away from the other part. This is the only evidence for tectonics we have in the solar system beside the Earth. It has long been believed that Mars was too small to have tectonics. I think that may be true, but I also think this is clear evidence that tectonics is related to impacts. In my presentation about heat, I showed that this is the case for the Earth as well. Mars shows more. There are clear patterns that there has been water on Mars in the past. Half the planet used to be covered in water. This can be interpreted as a massive flood that has been on Mars. Did the same happen on Mars as on Earth? And now the last subject. When we look at the moon, we see that one side looks completely different than the other. It seems like the crater distribution is not the same on both sides. On one side we see a lot of gigantic craters, on the other side we see only small craters, which might be mostly secondary craters. This means the crater distribution is not the same on both sides. When the time span is billions of years this doesn't make sense, because the moon rotates around its axis in a month. So in billions of years the crater distribution should be equal. The moon isn't the only body in the solar system where this phenomenon is found. This is a height map of Mars for example. The southern half has a lot of craters and the northern half only has a few craters. Some scientists say this is because the craters in the north have been wiped out. This could be, but on the other hand, let's take a look at this crater here. This one isn't round. An elliptical crater is extremely rare. It only forms when the impact angle is extremely shallow, like 15 degrees or less. Since materials fall down, the impact angle usually is a lot steeper. So 15 degrees is almost a miss. We can see where this meteorite came from. It came from the south. So it is pointing to the side where most craters are. So these craters seem to be evidence that the impact was one-sided. Mars orbits around its axis in 24 and a half hours. So if this was because of a one-sided bombardment, the bombardment lasted very short. Also, Miranda, a moon of Uranus, shows a lot more craters on one side than the other. Same for Enceladus, a moon of Saturn. So if the meteor bombardment was very one-sided on many bodies in the solar system, the Earth could not have been missed. Does this mean this applies for the Earth as well? It could be, especially when one considers that the continents may have been all at one side of the Earth. Maybe that is the unimpacted side, while the other side is the impacted side. In a way, the Earth is very similar to the Moon. One side with small craters, the other side covered almost entirely in basaltic lava. On the Moon this is clearly related to large impacts. Why wouldn't that apply for the Earth as well? So here's the conclusion. The uniformitarian model is incorrect. The sequence of the moon and the time span is refuted by the evidence. The solar system has been involved in a catastrophic event. The moon shows strong evidence for a large bombardment over a short time span. 
Many celestial bodies in the solar system show a one-sided bombardment, which implies a short time span for a catastrophic event. There is evidence for a large flood on Mars, and this also has implications for the Earth. In this bombardment, the Earth could not have been missed. The ocean floor is made of basalt, and the moon basalt flows are strongly associated with large impact basins. Also, evidence on the Earth itself fits a single one-sided bombardment. So it seems that the entire solar system has been involved in a Genesis flood. Thank you for watching this presentation. You can subscribe to my YouTube channel and you can find more information on my website geodetective.wordpress.com